We're here with Father Byron Miller at the Shrine of Blessed Francis Xavier Silos in New Orleans, Louisiana. We're so excited to be here. I'm so touched and humbled because this is not only such a great saint, and he is, you know, you're beatified, you know, you're there, uh, but he's not as important for this time. He is a sign, a symbol for, number one, the priesthood, and number two, the laity, so we understand what the role is and how dedicated our priests are. And many people, that when they come to the shrine, they do feel a sense of hospitality and a lot of healing and hope, and they do feel at home here, mostly because of our great staff but also because that charisma of Father Silos has never left this church when he died. 140 some odd years later, people still sense his presence and with his great reliquary, sacred reliquary right behind us. So we welcome any pilgrims to the National Shrine. We're uh, always come. pleased to have you. Y'all come, <laughs> you got it, uh, y'all come. And so we're happy to have you. And this Sunday at one o'clock here in the National Shrine of Blessed Francis Xavier Silos, we're gonna have one of three annual events and it's another healing mass where this entire church will be filled with people far and wide who are just uh, on fire with the Lord and who are taken by Father Silos' charisma and his reputation for healing. And, and you're, you're going to get to see that. You're going <laughs> to well, be you're here. you're going to be here. Because we're going to be here. We're going to tape that, and we're going to put it as part of our program. <laughs> All right. Sounds we're going to share some of the uh, testimonies. Uh, Father's going to share a little bit about the shrine, but we're, later we're going to speak to some of the people who have had um, experiences through the intercession of Blessed Silos. It's very exciting. We do have to get his canonization into the work. So pray. We want a lot of you to pray for the intercession of Blessed Silos. You can get prayer cards here. You can get rosaries. Anything to do with Blessed Silos here at the National Shrine in New Orleans. We're doing a little promotion for the shrine. <laughs> All right. No uh, problem. It's very important. This program is very important. Many things happen to block it. Uh, I know every inch of New Orleans. <laughs> Parts we don't want to know. <laughs> It's for today. We are, we the church, are under attack. And the reason it is such unrelenting attack on Mother Church is because we need her. And we need these shepherds to lead us. Otherwise, we're going to be like lost sheep. Two of the great areas of Blessed Silos were his, uh, his priesthood and his uh, abilities as a confessor. Now, confession today is, is gone. Very few people go to confession, but every time we go to a, a redemptress church, and we had made a program on uh, St. John Neumann, the lines for confession every day were out the door, and you're gonna see this Sunday the lines for confession here. We need to get back to the gift of reconciliation he was one of the most beautiful confessors, mm. very compassionate, gentle. gentle, and yet very firm. And he was a priest in every sense of the word. So these are two of the areas that are so important to our church today. We have to show the world about our priests, who our priests are, and we have to tell our own people, get back to confession. And I'm glad you mentioned that because, yes, Father Silos had a reputation of being ahead of his time in the uh, sacrament of penance, and people would wait. The line would snake hours uh, mm -hmm. and hours. It would just snake around the church, and people would wait hours and hours to be able to get into the confessional just to hear a few minutes of uh, Father Silos' healing words mm -hmm. and to hear what they longed to hear, all of us longed to hear, even mm -hmm. to this day, that God, despite our own sinfulness, that God still understands and is willing to give us the benefit of the doubt and to forgive us. And so he was a gentle uh, confessor. People loved him. He loved that sacrament. He spent so many hours there. And in fact, in the four confessionals in the back of this church, he sat in all of them. Uh, they're the original confessionals that were around in his day. So on Sunday, as in the previous times, we will have a lot of people who are going to take advantage of that sacrament, as they will with the sacrament of anointing of the sick. Praise so God. it's going to be a great day on Sunday, and I'm glad that the, your uh, viewers are going to be able to take part in it vicariously. Yeah. He didn't spend very much time here in New Orleans, but it seemed like he wanted this to be his final resting place. There's a tradition of a, uh, a, a nun that he met on the train heading down to New Orleans for his final 
assignment, and she said to him, how long will you be in New Orleans? And he said, I'll be here for one year, and then I will die of yellow fever. And mm. that's exactly what happened to him. Uh, what I would like to uh, add to that is that I think a lot of people have this inclination to think that being a saint, it's something you're born with, you're either born with it or you're not. And Silos would certainly counter that uh, belief. And so, sure, he had the, the proper elements, but I think a good argument could be made that sanctity begins at home. And Father yes. Silos had a wonderful family life. They were a close-knit Catholic family mm -hmm. in Fusen, and what they would do is uh, in the morning, you know, they would uh, begin by going it together as a family, going to morning mass, then they would go do their chores, go to school. When they would come back at the end of the day, at dinner time, they would have prayers in the Angelus, and then over the meal, they would talk about things that they learned at school. After, they would do readings from the lives of the saints. Lives of the wow. saints. Lives of the saints. And that's where Silos first heard about his patron saint, his namesake, Francis Xavier, the famous Jesuit missionary. Mm -hmm. And he said then, I want to be another uh, Francis Xavier. And of course, it was a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's really important. The family atmosphere has so much to do with how you live your life and where, what direction you're going to go. And, and this was the case with so many of the saints that we've written about, but especially with Blessed Francis of Silos. I'm so happy to be here because we are walking through the life of a symbol, a symbol of obedience, of uh, love. Now, it was not easy for him to leave his family. Father said they were close-knit. He loved Very his family. He family. loved his family. And it was like ripping a part of him, out of him. But he knew that this is what the father was saying. And so he said yes. Apparently, and he, he must have had a, a vision of Our Lady or a, some sort of an experience with Our Lady, after which he realized that his vocation was to be a missionary. That's I correct. must be a missionary. He did. Now, the cost of being a missionary was leaving your family. And leaving his beloved Bavarian. Uh, he wasn't he didn't really like the United States. He didn't really States. like the United yeah. States when he got here. Uh, and yes, it, it was different, and it is different. If you've ever been to the Bavaria, oh. you can understand it is such a magnificent country. It's God's country. It truly really is. In his day, in the little town of Houston, supposedly all but 20 of the citizens were Catholic. All but 20. He was Praise steeped God. in the Catholic environment. He grew up absorbed in Catholicism, kind of like what I take advantage of by being here in South Louisiana. But we are an anomaly in, in our country, and certainly in the South. And so he grew up that, in, in that environment. When he came to America, he was not at all prepared for the anti-Catholic hostilities that he yeah. faced in his day. And in many ways, he would be, he has something to say to our uh, current day and age. Mm -hmm. And that's why his message is timeless. It's so, his, it is so important. Uh, just one thing about his ministry here, in the, he was unbelievable. I mean, he was, he just, it was a complete sacrifice. He just gave his life completely up to with the, love, with he, love. He and a bunch of missionaries would go through the states, southern and midwestern states, during the Civil War, giving missions. He even um, he would they would be dodging bullets and and soldiers that were not very friendly to them on the trains, and yet he continued to do it. so much talk about social justice, social justice. So he was the epitome of true social justice through Christ, and Christ preached it. So here okay. you're going to learn about true love and compassion and a man, yes, the making of a saint, which, as Father said, started in his mother's arms. We're going to the next step in the... Way of life. What is this? The way uh, of yes, life? sir. Silos walk of life. Silos walk of life. And we're going to talk a little bit more when we get down there.
All right. Good to go. Well, what I would just like to mention is that this is the newest attraction at the National Shrine of Blessed Francis Silos, and it's called it's a room called the Silos Walk of Life. And what our intent was, and we feel that it is uh, being achieved, was that it wouldn't be another museum like we have behind uh, the shrine. That this one would be, by being a Silos Walk of Life, that people could come and do a kind of a spiritual pilgrimage experience, mm -hmm. and that they would come, not Indian file, but it, it would yeah. be kind of like on their own. They would learn about Father Silos, and then hopefully, like you would do maybe the Stations of the Cross, and that hopefully when they leave this particular experience, they would have a better understanding of his deep spirituality, and that they could leave emulating uh, yes. and tapping oh, into that. that. So that was the, the, at least the rationale behind it, and it kind of takes him on a journey from his Fusen, uh, his German background, and then as he comes to America, and that would be a typical, uh, that's an actual 1860s German, an authentic German immigrant trunk. Mm -hmm. He wow. came in the 1840s, but it would be similar to that. And then as he came to America, it shows some of the anti-Catholic hostilities that he mm -hmm. faced. Like that is a first edition book that has never been out of print, by the way. It's The Awful Disclosures of Mariah Monk, and it's totally sensational. And it was a book that was in circulation and in uh, Silos' day that created all kinds of uh, terrible things that they were uh, taking against the Catholic Church, and that only fueled and fanned the flames of anti-Catholic hostility. Still, still, never been out of print uh, to this day. That's the first edition. That's scary. It is, and so evidently it still has readers, but it's kind of sad. And then in this whole area is when Father Silos was, uh, you know, he's a Civil War uh, period, and he met President Abraham Lincoln. And he was quite impressed with our president, and he had an audience with the president, and the reason was is that you know there was a three hundred dollars that you had to pay if you wanted to get a man out of being drafted, oh. and with so many seminarians and young priests and, and brothers that we had in the Redemptorist congregation, that would have been quite a, an yeah. expense. And so he wasn't trying to not let our guys do their duty. His father Silos is belief was that our men could be better as chaplains in the Civil War. And he wanted them to be able to finish their studies and not have to pay 300 bucks uh, to get out. So he went to make that appeal to President Lincoln. And uh, essentially, he lived by his own words. He had been a chaplain in the Civil War in different places. And so um, ultimately, Lincoln was the perfect diplomat, listened to him. But as it turns out, he didn't say yes or no if he was going to uh, you know. Follow that's Father Silos' advice. That's, that's a politician. <laughs> that's a definite politician. And so this, though, this area has some of Silos' uh, elements of mortification, even though they weren't the original ones. Oh. So you see this little Silesium? Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the Redemptress in Father Silos' day, they would wear it around under their habit, yeah. uh, their arm here, where these little uh, prickly things yeah. constantly remind them of the crown of thorns that Jesus had to endure. They would have it, uh, and, they're like, and Silos wore this, and you would never guess that he, was, uh, he had that on. And then the discipline, or the little cord, yeah, or the yeah, whip there, yeah. at night, they would basically, you know, whip yeah, themselves. Flagellate so, themselves. Exactly. So some of these things that, you know, and, and the, the, and the this little snuff bottle, Silos, you know, was an <laughs> old world uh, German, and so he enjoyed a good uh, little snuff. When he got into the novitiate, his novice master told him, look, you got to let go of those kind of pleasures. No sooner said than done. He gave up snuff, and he, he was convinced. He wrote his family. He said, look, I gave up snuff, and I'm not going to have it ever again. And I'm convinced that there will be snuff in heaven. So <laughs> Father Seals would probably have it. a good I dip in it. heaven right now. So, you know, he gave up some pleasures. He didn't put salt. Even in New Orleans, with all the great oh, culinary God. stuff we have uh, now and in his day, he didn't take advantage of the great pleasurable uh, dining experience that can be had in New Orleans. Now, he said it constantly communicated with his family back home, didn't he? Yes, sir, he did. Yeah. There was a tremendous, even though he never saw them again, there was a great relationship with yeah. them. Thank man. God for letters. And he wrote constantly because he felt that people who were asking for spiritual direction, he felt remiss if he didn't answer. So much so that in the last year of his life, um, his provincial discouraged him from writing letters. But fortunately for us, it came very at the end of his life. He wrote letters throughout his life, and he wrote a lot to his family since he was so close to them, and he never got to see them again after he came to America. What a price. Yes. What a price. So this is, um, was intended to be the surprise element in the, the actual Silos Walk of Life. So y'all got a scoop here. So, okay. you know, we're going to go ahead and, and let Praise the viewers God. know what awaits them when they come around the little zigzag wall. And what it is, is basically uh, we had a professional museum company that helped us with this space, and they floated the idea of a diorama. And the best scene that we thought that was most appropriate is what really happened in Father Silos' life. 
he ministered to a man here in, the, uh, in New Orleans who was dying of yellow fever because he promised that he was going to come and, and minister him, to him, even though he himself had already contracted the disease. And what happened was, in September of 1867, he wasn't feeling well, and he was uncharacteristically quiet and, and looked a little uh, yellowish and stuff at, at lunch, at, at table. And he asked his superior if he could fulfill that, that ministerial duty that he had said he was going to do even though he wasn't up to par. He comes and he gives this guy uh, a blessing, gives him the last sacrament, and then when he comes back to the rectory here in New Orleans, the last three weeks of his life, he never gets out of bed. And he suffers with the yellow fever violently, really badly, until he died himself serenely on October 4th, 1867. So this scene depicts Father Silos in, uh, hab in the Redemptor's habit. This guy's a little yellow, you know? He, uh, <laughs> he's got the, the, the ravages of yellow fever. And Father Silos is giving him extreme unction in Latin, and so the little thing this triggers. This is the last minister. Of the last minister. Isn't that wild? I mean, what a martyr for the cause. Exactly. Yeah. And it's so touching that he did this last act. The thing that most uh, permeated his life and his existence, and that is mercy, reconciliation, giving people a chance to open the gates. He's opening the door to heaven for right. this man. At, at the risk of his own, his own health, his own life, and as it turned out, it was the last thing he did. It's a very powerful, powerful saying. I mean, this is somebody you really have to get to know. There's just not enough out about him because he is really, he's really a great role model for priests and for lay people. Right. In the uh, Silos Walk of Life, is a very rare mm. first-class relic in that it is the actual hair of Blessed Francis Xavier Silos. And we didn't even know we had it, yeah. that it existed until a few years back. And you can see the hair right here mm. and the writing, that beautiful writing. It says, Hair of Rev. Father Francis Zave Silos, 4 October 1867, by Brother Lewis. It was Brother Lewis Kenning. Yeah. And Brother Lewis had spent part of his novitiate year with Father Silos way, way back in the early years um, when they began their redemptorist life together in Baltimore. And then as fate would have it, they ended up together here in New Orleans. And when Silos was diagnosed with yellow fever, as were a few other redemptorists at the time, Brother Lewis was the infirmarian. So he had uh, part of his Access duty to take to care of him. But he was also the analyst or the chronicler for the community. And what he did was when Silos died on that very date, he cut not one, but two locks of Father Silos' hair. Oh. And then he, this is very, very coarse paper they used back then. And yeah. he put it in, and he made like what you would do, like a little paper airplane when I was in grade school. Uh, yes. He folded it all together, you know, with no scotch tape or anything that they didn't, they didn't have in their day. And he put it in, in, the, uh, in his journal. And no one knew that, they, that, we, that that even existed until our archivist found it in Denver. The fact that it you know, moved from here to yet two other locations and ended up in Denver at our archives. And you know, never, never, never even knew that, that Brother Lewis had done it, much less that it would still be around to that day. Paul is going to share with us about something that uh, Blessed Silos has talked about priests and their duties in the confessional. Yes, Father Silos, as we had mentioned before, was a very gentle confessor and was uh, really ahead of his day. And what he had was some, some of the harshest words that have ever come out of Father Silos' mouth, and they were for other priests who were um, very cold and uncaring and, and harsh in the sacrament. And he pretty much told them that they were sinning, at least in ignorance, if they scandalized people by being mean to people in the sacrament of confession. And he encouraged them to be very gentle and understanding. And in that way, I, I think that was very, very refreshing and uh, insightful on Father Silos's part. The sacrament is reconciliation, not beat up on the people that come in. <laughs> At any rate, uh, people were afraid to go to confession, and so it, it wasn't until after Vatican II that we, we became aware that it's really the sacrament of getting back together with the church, reconciling, reconciling which reconciling. is the church. Father Silos, uh, that was the main thrust of his uh, ministry and confession. 
And in the pulpit, he actually would make a little a revival call. And he would say, I encourage all of you to come into the sacrament of confession. And he said, and if I am harsh to you, you have the right to call me a liar. And so, I mean, he basically was laying his own reputation on the line. He was truly a refreshing God. man, especially when it comes to that sacrament. I recall Angela Boudreau was the miracle that was given for the uh, beatification of yeah. our Father Seals. Yeah, Could exactly. you tell us a little bit about that? Right. Her case was unanimously approved by the Vatican Praise as the miracle that got Father Seals beatified. And what happened was she was a mother of uh, several children in the and she was in her 30s. In the 1960s, she was diagnosed with liver cancer, and 90% of her liver was cancer, only 10% of the organ was uh, still, and they, when they opened her up right there at the hospital, Baptist Hospital, they gave her two weeks to live. Mm -hmm. And she literally, what was so neat about it was that she literally left the hospital and came to the Silos uh, tomb to pray. And mm -hmm. this was in 1966. She prayed before his tomb. They blessed her with the original Father Silo's cross, and she knew some redemption and stuff, and so they blessed her. And then long story short, when she had a, a, only a, a small amount of radiation, we're talking 1966, only yeah. a small amount of treatments, yeah. but no doctor worth uh, his salt would say that it was enough to be able to, to you know, yeah. take away 90% of the cancer. Right. Now they said it was scar tissue. She doubled her lifespan, and she and her husband in, in 2000 were able to come to Rome, and during the beatification ceremony, they presented the Holy Father wow. with the gift from the Redemptress. So she lived to see her little children grown. She lived to see grandchildren. She died a very happy woman, and she volunteered all the way till the end, uh, promoting and telling her story here at the Silo mm -hmm. Center. Mm -hmm. Father, it has been an unbelievably beautiful experience being here at the shrine, visiting all the aspects of the shrine and the uh, we're looking forward to the Mass on Sunday, where we're going to have the, what is it, three time a year healing Mass of Blessed Silos. We believe this is going to be a powerful program for Blessed Silos and for his, the cause for his canonization. We do have to get him canonized, folks. There are a lot of, there are a lot of possible uh, miracles that have taken place that the Church has not ruled on yet. But pray for the intercession of uh, Blessed Silos. Ask him to help you, especially in areas of spirituality um, and, and of physical illness. An expression that uh, someone once made about the mission, this is a little bit of heaven. When you come in here, come on the grounds, See, they're, they're, just, they're, just they're, affirmed it. they're clapping as hard as they can. <laughs> now you feel him. You feel his presence. Um, it's so wonderful to have you here mm. because you represent him. And uh, I once said to Mother Angelica, she said, well, you had to say it. I said, no, no, you're a religious. You have to say it. And we believe in our priests. Well, if our priests say it, we believe it. And so imagine Father Silos with his gentleness and his compassion and his love. He loved his, his people. So and at a time when the priesthood is so under attack, mm. when the time when people are not, we, we have parish priests who sit in the confessional and get all their reading done because nobody ever shows up. We need people to go back to the sacrament of reconciliation. Watch when you see the, the program, when you see the Mass on Sunday, you have the lineup of people going to confession here. Clean out anything that's in you that's, that's bothering you. Ask Blessed Silos for his help. You know, we learn that the priest is another Christ in our presence. In persona Christi, in the person of Christ. Do you know that? When you go up to your priest, do you kiss his hand? Do you thank him for his priesthood, for his faithfulness to his vocation? Do you thank him for being, having a place where you can be reconciled with God? Uh, I overheard uh, two, uh, well, one of them was my grandson, and the other was a girl, she was a Lutheran girl, and she said, you know, I don't have to uh, confess to a priest. I confess straight to God. And I just kind of held my breath. 
wondering what my grandson was going to say. He was a freshman in college at the time. <clears throat> and he said, you know, I don't know about you, but I need to hear a priest say, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. And what a blessing we are. See, blessed Silas is agreeing with us. Thank you, Thank Father, you, Father. So Thank you, Father. Thank you for everybody who is working here at the shrine, all of the volunteers, all the people working here. And we just pray that our Lord Jesus uh, will help us through the intercession of blessed Silas. The question is all ours. So oh, you have been a blessing to us, Thank and it's you. been a privilege to have you here. And I hope that you can take some of uh, Silos' animated spirit with you oh. and spread that in your travels and in your pilgrimages uh, here and throughout the world. So God bless you both. Thank Thanks. For, and Thank Sunday you. is World Day of Prayer for Vocations, as it turns out, yes. uh, this particular. Wow. And so we will hope to use Father Silos' great love for the priesthood and his uh, wonderful capacity to attract vocations in his day and still to this day, mm -hmm. we're going to capitalize on that on Sunday. Praise God. And Father, would you uh, bless... Just bless the people. Bless our, uh, our viewers who are so faithful. Through Father Silos' prayers in heaven, united with ours now at his national shrine on your behalf, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We Thank love you. you. God bless you, Father. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for Thank having you, me. Father. Yeah. Family, be sure to watch next week when we bring you the conclusion of our program on Blessed Francis Xavier Silos. There are some scenes from the powerful healing mass and blessing of the sick. Join us as we show you thousands of people praying for the intercession of Blessed Silos. In addition, we'll bring you interviews with people who have had miraculous healings and conversions. You don't want to miss this next week on Super Saints at the same time. We love you. God bless you. Family, one of the most exciting and awe-inspiring religious services we have ever attended is the Blessed Silos Healing Mass, which takes place three times a year at the Church of St. Mary in New Orleans, Louisiana. We had been told about it before, but had never experienced it for ourselves. So along with anywhere from 2,000 to 3,000 other believers, we went to the church on this special day not only to attend Mass and healing service, but to bring it to you in this program. At the entrance to the church, the faith will pause and pray before his original casket, the burial place, which was lost for over a hundred years until the shrine construction began. temporary burial place on the main altar. And finally, the reliquary which contains the remains of Blessed Francis Xavier Silos.
people come and pray for his intercession at the reliquary. If you have never seen it, you cannot believe the faith, the reverence, the absolute trust in our Lord Jesus through his blessed silos. People from all over Louisiana and some from many parts of the country come to pray in petition to receive the sacrament of the healing and or to thank our Lord Jesus and blessed Silos for the gifts they have received. The excitement builds as the faithful begin to fill the church. As we told you the other day, the line for the confessionals on both sides of the church are full up until the mass begins. They sit in the pews praying the rosary or some other prayers while they wait for the appointed hour when the miraculous will begin on the altar. Finally, our priests come down the aisle to the main altar in grand procession. They ascend the altar and the mass begins.
After the final blessing, the healing service begins. The faithful line up to receive the healing through the intercession of Father Silos. In the midst of the chaos and unbelievable destruction wrought upon the people of Louisiana, a light cuts through the darkness. The church is alive. Though they appear broken and wounded, the faith that never died shines brightly. Family, after the healing service, we will be bringing you testimonies of healings and conversions through the intercession of Blessed Silos. But look at all these people with such faith and hope. How many miracles do you think will be experienced that we'll never hear about? A case in point, when we came back from New Orleans, we brought back a first-class relic of Blessed Silos to place in our chapel. However, a member of our church had just been operated on for cancer of the stomach and the esophagus branching out into the lymph nodes. The consensus was not good. They were not able to get all the cancer out. They could not give him chemotherapy because of what he went through with the operation. The doctors were waiting to see what regimen they could put him on. We immediately brought him the relic of Blessed Silos, which was he has kept on himself from that time to this. This week, he went back for a two-month checkup. The cancer was gone. It was just a little speck, too small for the doctors to do a biopsy. Praise Jesus. We want to share with you now some of the uh, testimonies that we received while we were there at the Shrine of Blessed Francis Xavier Silos. Family, we're here with uh, Steve and Cynthia Lyons from Mountain View, Arkansas. Uh, Cynthia has had a, an extremely uh, ex extreme experience with through the intercession of Blessed Silos. And we're going to ask Steve most of the questions because she was in a coma when it all happened. But Steve, uh, all of a sudden, uh, she was at the dire part of her uh, sickness, illness in the hospital when things looked like they were pretty, pretty bad. And you had the inspiration to, to uh, start studying about Blessed Francis Xavier Silas. You want to tell us a little bit about that? 
who was a particularly uh, attractive uh, uh, person because I felt like that he had an exceptionally uh, kind heart. Yes, that's true. And uh, so I uh, uh, looked into that and read about him. And uh, when, when Cynthia was uh, sick, I uh, chose to ask him to be an intercessory. So, as it turned out, uh, Father John Lewandowski from the church in Mountain Home, Mountain View, had a first-class relic of Blessed Silos, and Steve asked if, if he had one. And, and Father John said yes, he would send it over with a couple, and they would go to the hospital with Steve and Cynthia and pray over. Now, at this point, uh, the prognosis, there were a lot of doctors involved, but the, the consensus was she may not make it through the night. And any rate, they were not expecting her to live And very she was long. in a coma. That's and correct. She was in and out of a coma. She'd been in, what, two comas? Mm -hmm. yeah. And so Steve and the couple came over, and they prayed over uh, Cynthia. And with I, the relic. With the relic of Blessed Silos. Now, uh, did... Uh, did you pray more than one night or just that one night? Over? Well, uh, actually, I prayed many nights. But uh, the, uh, with the relic and the, our, our friends, yeah. uh, it was just one night. Just one night. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, when did you see a change, if any? Well, the next day, actually. The next day? Yeah. Did she come out of the coma? Or? Yes, she did. Praise God. Yeah. Praise God. And she didn't remember anything. No. No. <laughs> she still doesn't remember. No, I still don't. <laughs> now, uh, Steve, uh, have you always been Catholic? No. No. He, he, Steve was not a Catholic when he asked for the, uh, the, relic? For the relic of blessed Is that true? Yes. Whoa. Whoa. Yes. Good for you. I know. I'm, I'm, it's very exciting. Yeah. Now, was it a year since you've been in the church? No. Um, yeah, a little less than a year. A little less than yeah. a year. It was, I guess it was on Easter of uh, last year or this year? Yeah, it, last year. Easter yeah. of last year that he came into yeah. the church. He came home. Yeah, I did. The, um, so so from, from being yes. on death's door, uh, actually the day after they prayed with the relic of uh, Blessed Silos, Cynthia condition began to turn around uh, and, uh, and she, today she's walking around. She's had many operations since then, but today she's walking around healed through the intercession of Blessed Silos. That's right. And you know, what is so remarkable, you weren't even Catholic. <laughs> yes, that's right. See? That's right. Yet. And the Holy Spirit was after you, boy. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right, Penny. That's exactly right. I used to joke uh, with Cynthia that we've been together, as I said, for 25 years. And uh, she said, well, when are you going to convert? And I said, well, you can't rush into these things. <laughs> <laughs> this is what oh, is right here. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but uh, yeah, finally I did. And, uh, Praise God. Praise God. Now, how has she been since? Has, has she had a recurrence of, uh, of the problem? Well, she, she's, every day, she gets a little bit better. I see little improvements every day. Praise God. And uh, she's, uh, she's going to make it. We're here with Joyce Bourgeois and her daughter, Christine. Uh, and they have a very special story to share about a healing uh, of Christine through the intercession of Blessed Silas. And now, Joyce, tell us a little bit about what happened. Okay, back in 1961, Christine had meningococcal meningitis, and uh, she was blind, deaf, and mm. lame, and she was transferred from the small hospital to Charity Hospital, and the doctors were waiting for her. Meanwhile, my husband's cousin called the convent and asked, would they please pray for the baby cousin that was dying? Mm -hmm. And the nun said, Ronnie, if somebody can come and pick up a relic of Father Silos, we can't promise you a miracle, but it won't mm -hmm. hurt to pray. 
gives me the Christine chills. Christine stayed in the hospital for almost three months. She had major brain surgery, and the last time they went in, which was 19 days later after her last surgery, she had developed bacterium and septicemia, so they had to remove a bone flap. This was because of all this infection. Yeah. And um, the day before she was discharged, the doctor said to me, We're, you're taking your baby home tomorrow. I don't know if she's gonna be around for another week, month, or year, but for however long you're going to have her, she will be totally dependent upon you. Mm -hmm. Christine has been truly, uh, you know, she has been, she has been such a gift. And I didn't know Father Silos was here, buried here in St. Mary's. It was now, I guess about 21, 22 years ago, I was in a religious bookstore and I found out Father Silos was buried beneath the altar in St. Mary's. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to come and say thank you to Father Silos, and I've been thanking him ever since. Mm. And I can tell you that the day that I came to thank him, I knew that this was the place that I had to be. Yeah, and so you've been thanking Blessed Silos all these years. All these years, mm -hmm. and we see so many, we see so many prayers answered through the intercession of Blessed Silos. Yes. Praise God. That is a powerful, powerful witness. Powerful Thank you testimony. so much. Thank you. Uh, and we love you. We love you too. Thank you. We're here with Dr. Anna Maria Poe at the Shrine of Blessed Silos, and she has a very special witnessing that she wants to share with us about her conversion. Uh, I just uh, would like to inject the reason that we're asking Dr. to give her witness is that we here have seen the church alive. And as long as there are people like have been in the church right now in this shrine, the church will never die, nor will our country ever die. Doctor, would you like to share your experience? So I'd like to tell everybody how I came to know Father Silos and to really find my faith again. I am a native of New Orleans, and I had moved away uh, after I finished medical school at LSU. And I returned home to join the faculty at LSU in September of 2004. As most of you remember, Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans in August of 2005. I was on call at one of the local community hospitals during that time. As you know, the city flooded and the hospital conditions everywhere in the city were very poor and lots of patients died. Following the storm, myself and two of my nursing colleagues were arrested uh, for murder following investigation by the Louisiana Attorney General for deaths at the hospital in which I was working. I couldn't really believe that all of this had happened to me. Although I had a very strict Catholic upbringing many years prior to this, I had essentially left the church and really spent a lot of my life being mad at God, blaming him for all of the suffering I'd seen in my patients and in my family members. And, and I really didn't believe that God was all loving and all merciful. <laughs> so this was a very difficult time for me. It was the thing that I, I enjoyed doing most in my life was taking care of my patients, my reputation, everything was at risk. I was fighting for my life, but I was trying to do it alone. I had the help of my family and friends, but I didn't have a lot of faith. In February of 2007, the grand jury had been convened, and I was walking down Magazine Street, and I was really in terrible shape mentally. And I ran into an acquaintance I hadn't seen in 25 years who recognized me, saw me, said she was praying for me, and she said, you have to come to the Father Silo Shrine. She says, they are wonderful people there, healing miracles occur there, and they really help people regain their faith. And I just said, okay, and she grabbed me instantly and brought me to the shrine where I met Joyce Bourgeois, Father Miller, Anthony, and some other people who were here that day. And as I said, it was really in a very dark and terrible place. And the people here helped me to trust in God again and to help me to regain my faith and to know with certainty that no matter what happens in our life, that he is all loving, all forgiving, and all merciful. 
So it was a very uh, long and difficult time for me. The grand jury convened uh, starting in February, and I didn't know my fate until July of that year. And there were days that were just unbearable, the loneliness and the grief. And I knew that if I could get myself to the shrine, if I could literally drag myself out of bed and get here, that I would be okay. Because it was through the prayer and through all the support of everyone here that I got through this very long and painful ordeal. And I come to know uh, uh, Father Silos. He, he practiced what God priest preached. He was really Jesus on earth. And I am very grateful for having uh, come to know him and his work also. So in July of 2007, the New Orleans Grand Jury rendered a no true bill, which means that I was not indicted, Praise and neither God. were the nursing colleagues. Praise God. And Praise that was God. probably so through Silos who did that That was, for well, you. it was through, believe me, lots of prayer, and I think the intervention of, of you know, God and Father Silos and the Blessed Virgin and everybody, everybody's support that I had. And my husband and I fell on our knees and thanked God for, mm. for his mercy and compassion. So now you're back, back at the church. Yeah. So time. now, um, well, starting in, in February, the first day that I was brought to the shrine, I, I go to Mass and Communion every Sunday. I go to Mass as often as possible. I pray every day. My husband now has also come back to the church after many years of being away. And I know that through prayer, anything is possible. It's not to say that my life has been easy since then. I still face many challenges. But the wonderful thing about this is that no matter what happens, I know that God will be faithful to me because he has been over and over and over again. Praise God. So I'm very grateful for everyone here who has helped me, and I'm very grateful to Paul Silos, and I'm very grateful to God for they, bringing we, me back to the church. Anna Maria, we want to thank you. That, that's a beautiful testimony you gave. It really and, is. And, and I think it's needed today. It really is really needed. want to hear this. There is always, always hope. Where there is faith, there is always hope. We... Finally, on December 24th, 2001, Mother Angelica suffered a massive stroke. A relic of Blessed Silos, who had only been beatified the year before, was brought up to Our Lady of the Angels Monastery in Hansville, Alabama. Mother's surgeon stated that he had performed 100 brain surgeries, like the one he performed on her, and only one patient survived. That was Mother Angelica. My dear brethren, I never thought it was so sweet to die in the congregation. I now begin to know what happiness is to live and die a redemptorist. Oh, let us all love our vocation and strive to persevere in it. Then all will be right with us. I know that I have not lived as I should. I fear that I have often scandalized you by my faults and imperfections. But I now on my deathbed beg your pardon for the scandal I have given you. Family, we have been blessed to have such a powerful intercessor right here in our country. Pray to Blessed Silos for his intercession. Visit the shrine in New Orleans. God is so good. God wants to heal us. God wants to give us hope. In this time of trial in our world, in our country, God wants us to know he is in charge. We love you. Bye.